Welcome to the Medical Mnemonist Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, take a journey into the top techniques for medical mnemonics, study skills, board exam tips, and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. So if you're listening to this episode, you're probably wondering why we're covering Jeopardy, which is a little bit different than how we're usually discussing learning topics and memory techniques in this show. But today we have a Jeopardy Tournament of Champion, Sam Cavanaugh. Sam, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Chase. Uh, happy to be here. So this is going to be interesting. We've covered so many other areas in past episodes with memory champions, with teachers of mnemonics, with physicians that create educational material and cognitive psychologists that really look into the evidence base for techniques. But I'd say something like winning Jeopardy, especially a tournament of champions of all things, that really covers the practical application of learning in some degree that we might not really understand or even have good evidence for. It's probably not something that's been studied a lot. So just kind of curious to give a broad overview. Like, Who are you? How'd you go from a uh, teacher to a Jeopardy champion. Yeah, let's go from there. Yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota and have been watching Jeopardy my whole life. I'd come home from school and it'd be on TV. I'd watch it with my Australian mother. Just kind of build up the interest in that. I, I would say around 2010 is when I started getting really serious about it. It's been a long process. I tried out, I was in college at the time. And I tried out for the college tournament a couple times, made it to a round of auditions and never made it past there. I bombed that audition. I was not ready. Eventually, in 2017, I took another every year, took the, took the online test, did well enough just in terms of just base knowledge that they invited me for an audition. I had to skip out on work for a day to fly to Chicago and pretend to be good in front of a camera. I mean, if you've seen the show, it's a pretty low bar for interesting people, maybe. But, you know, you try, to, you try to do what you can to make sure that you're interesting enough for TV. And then they said that I would be in the contestant pool for 18 months. If they wanted me, they'd call me. If they didn't, they wouldn't. 18 months later, I was visiting family in Australia. I got the call. I was on the show in 2019. Won five games at that point. There was a two-year wait for the next tournament of champions, which... I spent a lot of time improving, proving myself. I was not ready for the show the first time around and to the degree that I wanted to be. Kind of got lucky a few times. I certainly was not the most knowledgeable person up there on any of my games, I'd probably say. I think that's fair. But was able to game it out and kind of perform better. I wanted to make that change for the Tournament of Champions because I was one of the first people in the contestant pool. I knew who I was going to play. I knew who I was going to play, and they were all very, very intelligent people. So I needed to bulk up, essentially. And so a lot of that involved just really expanding my knowledge base in, I mean, I had a couple years, but given that they can ask about everything, and especially in the Tournament of Champions, they can go deep into topics that they wouldn't necessarily go to quite as deep in the regular season. So I really needed to improve what I knew and how quickly I could recall it. I think... There are a lot more similarities in this than the audience probably realizes at first. And first, I, I have to say, I'm definitely sending this episode to a friend of mine that watches Jeopardy religiously, and she always seems to scream out the answers before the contestants do. <laughs> but now, the process of going on to one of these education-based game shows is a little more understood. But yes, that the comparison I want to make is students are often told, especially in medical school, that you're drinking out of a fire hose. That's the terminology that everyone uses because there's so much information. They can cover anything. They can cover in any depth. And it, you know, even in something as complicated as medicine, you guys on shows such as Jeopardy have such a broad range of topics that you need to cover in such depth. And I definitely want to cover sort of the process for doing that and maybe some techniques you use as we progress. So Maybe you could tell us how you started bulking up from your initial interviews to really getting to where you felt comfortable with this. So I, I would say that the biggest 
thing that I started with was just, I mean, watching the show every day, there's an online archive of every single show and you can kind of sort all that data out a little bit and really trying to assess like, what are my strengths and weaknesses? I grew up with a father who was a, a geography teacher and we had maps all over the walls. So like, I'm, I'm very visual, especially with the geography. It's like, okay, that's a strength. I can build on that. But then I also have to focus on sort of these topics that I'm maybe a little bit more afraid of, things like opera, for example. And given that I had that, that couple years, I really, what I decided to do is that, so I, I like to think of memory in a few different ways. One of them is sort of like a net where every strand of this net that's kind of woven perhaps haphazardly together is like a piece of information that you know. And the more other strands that it touches, the more likely you are to retain that information. It, it gets stuck in that net. And so if I'm just going through, like, you know, I'm not like a memory champion. I'm not, I'm probably on the upper end of the bell curve, but I'm certainly not top 10%, I wouldn't say. I think I'm, I, especially compared to a lot of other Jeopardy champions, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. And so I'm not necessarily a person who knew to, or even I tried to approach, like I'm going to memorize this list of, you know, every... Nobel Prize winner in all the different categories or something like that. What I really wanted to do was figure out, kind of look at, sure, look over that list. Where do I maybe recognize some stuff and just start pulling at those strings, right? Trying to weave them into the things that I already know. And the biggest thing for that, for me, so again, topics like opera, maybe I wasn't really exposed to that previously in my life as much. And so I didn't have an interest in it. And so what I decided is like, okay, I know things and everybody, you know, I'm, a, I'm a teacher as well. Like I've seen this with kids. There could be a kid that's failing your class, but you, know, you ask him about Minecraft or something, and it's like, he'll tell you every little thing. He'll tell you about all the different texture packs. He'll, like, he knows his brain when he's interested in something is very capable of learning everything about that topic. And so really it's just like, okay, well, I can trick myself into being interested about opera. and you know, maybe it starts a little bit forced at first, but it eventually then kind of becomes a real thing that I can have some interest in. And the more interest and, and curiosity I have about it, the more likely it is to, again, weave into that net and stick. That brings up two interesting points, I think. One of them is the memory champions that I've interviewed and ones that I've heard interviewed in other areas and other podcast televised productions and such. They all say pretty much the same thing, that they're not special. They don't have a great memory. It's the way that they approach the materials, the tools that they use and implement and how they do it. And really, it's a creative process that takes a lot of practice. And that's how they win these memory championships. And the second one is what you just said about this wide net really reminds me of a topic called interleaving that we've covered a few times in the past. And it's one of the evidence-based study strategies and basically it says in brief that instead of maybe studying all of anatomy today and all of physiology tomorrow and all of biochemistry the next day to take shorter sections of each and intermix these different topics because you'll find connection points between these desperate subjects that make it easier to remember everything altogether. And it sounds like you're kind of explaining that same process. Yeah. And I'm actually glad that there's some evidence behind it because I kind of just figured that out on my own, but. That makes a lot of sense. You know, in college, I went to a liberal arts school and took a variety of classes, right? Because I was interested in so many things. And the things that I remembered the most, one, I was interested in it, but also the, if they could connect in sort of a multidisciplinary way, interdisciplinary way, that was when it really became something that I, you know, I still know a lot about. Yeah. And the other, the other thing I'd say is that self-knowledge for me was perhaps the most important thing of just Maybe when I first started, I had an idea of, you know, I'd look at Ken Jennings, say, the greatest cha uh, Jeopardy champion of all time, and say, like, well, that's what a Jeopardy champion's like, so I have to be like him. And that's kind of a losing strategy, right? Like, I'm, I'm not him. My brain works slightly differently. I'm sure we have a lot of overlap, I'm sure. But I needed to figure out what the Sam Kavanaugh as a Jeopardy champion looked like. So like, as you say, it's sort of like this creative process of like, I'm a little bit of self-discovery. It's like, okay, so I tried everything under the sun in terms of like how to memorize things and how to just gain more knowledge, especially for a relatively short time span. And at first, like there, there'd be things like I would see 
previous champion, Roger Craig, was a very analytical guy. He's a computer scientist, and he used this program called Anki, and as I'm sure you're aware, yeah. And he kind of had a full detail of how that worked for him and how that was so great. He, he was also a previous tournament winner. And I tried that, and it's, you know, it just didn't work for me in the way that it did for him. And it, so it was kind of disappointing because at first I was like, oh man, I don't have the chops. This isn't working for me. So maybe I can't be a champion, but I had to kind of tell myself, it's like, no, like that just doesn't work for me. I need to find some other thing. But one of the other things that I found was that, I mean, humans were, were social animals, right? And so like making it a social process was important for me because it, that's kind of what, at least for my brain, like that's kind of what triggers more memory. Like when I'm sort of like, it, I mean, it's kind of, kind of an online meme, right? Where you're laying in bed at night and you're thinking about all the mistakes you made in eighth grade, all these social faux pas or whatever. It's like, I remember that really well because that was a social problem. So it's like, okay, let's tie that together. So I'll get into a lot more of the things if you want to later, the, thing, the various techniques that I tried. But one of them uh, involved, I wrote, I was trying to memorize all of the impressionist artists of the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. And I got a set of postcards with some of their artworks and whatever. And it's sort of early stage of the pandemic. So I was trying to reach out to people, have those social connections. And I wrote a postcard to each person, cataloged what artists they were paired with. And so now it's like, okay, I have a friend, Anna, who is uh, very much paired with Toulouse-Lautrec in my mind. And so it's like, okay, I already know her. Let's, let's pair that up. You know, she's into dancing. He painted some Moulin Rouge stuff. It works out really well that way. So I could, I could kind of already figure out a way to attach it to something I already knew, and in this case, a person. Okay. Yeah, I think those are somewhat similar to different techniques we've used in the past, that finding that personal connection to the material is really important. And I think there are many different ways to do this. Anki is definitely a very powerful space repetition flashcard software. It's free. It's used by a good majority of medical students. But also, I noticed that when I initially used it anyway, I was not learning anything from it. And come to find out way too late that I wasn't really necessarily making the best types of flashcards. There's many different ways you could set it up. I think we've covered some flashcard techniques in past episodes if the audience wants to go back and listen as well. But I'm kind of comparing two different instances that are popping up in my mind. One is an ex relationship that I had that would remember so many details about a particular movie, the characters, the backstory, even the actors real life and the directors and producers. I'm like, how do you know all of that? I don't pay attention to the credits. Like I'm not trying to memorize everyone's name. Like, oh well, I go on to a forum, a Facebook group about that and have discussions with other people there so that can add that personal touch and being social and the other like you said kind of pairing things together this can be considered dual coding and we also have that as an evidence-based technique too and we can use it with mnemonics that we make too that are either real life examples like your friend created examples like visual mnemonics that we can just kind of pair actual information to and then it makes Remembering it easier because now you have two different things that you can potentially connect different aspects of your brain and your memory and your experiences with. So I think those are really strong and correlate very well with what the research says and what memory champions have said. And it's just interesting to hear that without having a background in that type of education or these types of memory techniques, you kind of develop them on your own and they <laughs> prove to be very effective. Yeah, I mean, again, it was a lot of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. I do have a, a background as an educator, middle school mostly. One of those overlaps for when you're preparing kids for you know the, the dreaded standardized tests of whatever kind. Um, and how that compares to Jeopardy. I would say that maybe the most important piece of advice that I would give to people who are trying out for Jeopardy, and I think it overlaps in these ways, is that consider it not as a test, but as a performance. If, like, I could know literally all information that they ask about, but if I can't pull it in, you know, that three second window, it doesn't matter. And sort of the same way for, I've seen a, with a lot of students, if you're doing some tests, some sort of exam, whether that's, you know, your an oral exam or just a timed written thing, a lot of people will get really nervous and 
that different environment is one that maybe they they weren't practicing recalling information in that sort of environment with that le level of pressure on them, and then that's they'll get a lot lower score than maybe they're used to. You know, within education, if like this is something that if your students have different IEPs, so let's say that they have some sort of learning disability. And that's a thing that as a teacher, you can kind of prep them for. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can definitely prep people for that. And like, you are supposed to like build that structure around it. But even if you don't have a diagnosed learning disability, recognizing that this learning environment and this testing environment are going to be things that challenge you. It's like a very important step for Jeopardy practice. I would, I would try to remember things, but I would also play the game every single day when it was on TV, I'd record it so I could pause and stuff. But I, and I would stand up behind my couch like it was the, the lectern. I'd put on the same clothes that I would wear on stage. So put on the nice dress shoes that are maybe a little less comfortable than what I'd normally be wearing in the house. Put on like this, you know, the suit jacket, all of this and have bright lights in my face. The studio is really cold. So especially in the winter here in Minnesota, I would open up the window and have that kind of chilled environment. And that was really helpful. And especially later on, I would have my girlfriend test me with some of that information by, I would be like, be standing on one leg trying to balance or something. So just like a little bit more to throw me off of like, okay, here's this novel situation that is taking up a lot of brain activity, right? Trying to balance like this, but I still have to recall this information. So like I'm, I'm testing myself when I'm practicing underneath these more strenuous environments. <laughs> That's amazing. It's funny because as you go on, you're covering more and more of the topics that we usually cover. And you just, you came across it just from, you know, having to figure things out and to push your limits. And like the testing effect is what we can call you know, being quizzed or quizzing yourself with pausing the video and answer the questions. Or if you have a, a Q bank for medical students, healthcare students, going through and answering the questions yourself and not just rereading notes or some sort of passive learning that you think you know the information until that stress is on that you actually have to answer it. And then I love that you add that extra bit of environmental stimulus and difficulty too. If you can do it under tougher instances and circumstances, then it's just going to be a little bit easier when you actually have to perform it you know, for when it counts. That was very vital. And I didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't self-create that. That was a previous previous champion so actually the uh, who ended up being the host the guest host during the tournament of champions buzzy cohen he wrote a book on preparing which he's a uh, i mean he had won the tournament of champions a few cycles ago and was also then a deadlifting champion of all things and so he he wrote he wrote an audio book that I, I pulled some of that stuff from so that was really helpful with that an interesting mix jeopardy champion and bodybuilder yeah he's coming at it from both sides it's a it's a double threat <laughs> <laughs> and a really good presenter and host, so you know, watch out, I guess. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts on this are. So one thing that a lot of students bring up is, you know, not just that we have to remember material for the next quiz, but in two years when you're taking the board exams or three years, ten years, trying to keep the material there for a long period of time, is that something that you also have to kind of overcome? Would you still be able to recall most of the information that you studied from your championship now, or is it sort of something that fades after time? No, I'm definitely you know slipping down the forgetting curve a little bit. So we we recorded the tournament in April, and I was you know at peak performance at that point, and I'm you know eighty ninety percent of that and falling a little bit because I haven't been keeping up with it. Like it it is a thing that you have to do repeatedly. And frequently, I, I ran track in high school, and I'd like to think of it very similar to our training for that, where you peak at a certain, you're trying, or your coach is trying to get you to peak at the time when it matters, when you're doing your clear sectional meet or something. And then you do that, and you run however well you run, and then the summer happens, and within two weeks, you're, you've, you fall back a month almost. So it is something that, you know, you as I'm sure you've talked about before, it, it has to keep being triggered. and. One of the ways, though, that that has been helpful for me is that, I mean, obviously, I'm just curious about things in general and involved in a lot of other trivia-related things. And so 
kind of by accident a lot of times. Like I'll go to a bar trivia or there's an online trivia league I'm a part of. Some of this stuff comes up and kind of re-triggers those memories. And then maybe I'm like, oh yeah, like what was, and I can read about it afterwards. I'll do a, a Wikipedia dive or something. So, you know, ha- again, having that, that interest in the subject kind of by default means that you're spending a little, at least a little bit of your free time reinvigorating those memories. True. And that's one thing that's probably really difficult for some learners going through, you know, a graduate degree or medical school is some of the topics aren't that interesting. The general aspect of medicine is very interesting, but sometimes when you take little sections, little classes, or maybe it was interesting until you had an instructor that you just didn't really learn that well from, didn't get along with, I guess that's a good time to try to develop your own interest in the material and make it fun. Find someone that has similar interests that you can talk with, you can learn from each other, you can quiz each other. I mean, that's kind of my thoughts on it, but do you have any other, I suppose, advice or, or tools that maybe you can explain that the audience might be able to benefit from in their own studies? Uh, yeah, actually, I wrote a list to prepare for this uh, interview here. I was trying to remember all of the different things that I, <laughs> that I did that worked and didn't work. So can I go through nice. some of this? Yeah, Okay. please. So again, the overall key was to tap into my own curiosity and kind of no, figure out how my brain works and, and run with what works and kind of back away from what doesn't. So one of the things that helped was I, I put lists of things on that, some of those dry subjects or stuff that I was forgetting a lot. I'd take a, I had a physical flashcard, I put it on the wall and just like tape it there. So every time I went to the bathroom, I went past this you know, list of poems by Tennyson or whatever. And so it's like, okay, I'm forcing that frequency to happen a lot. There's the I also did a lot of those social things, like the postcards I, I explained about or I explained earlier. That I did some social quizzing where just some friends who were nice enough to do this for me. I was like, okay, I'm trying to remember every character in like these ten Shakespeare plays. Here, take a card, quiz me on it, and then it's like a little bit more social anxiety pressure. So like that triggers it that way. For a lot of that dry material, like you were just talking about. You know, if, if it's dry, like figure out a way to, I mean, I guess make it wet. A lot of things. So again, like the, the Shakespeare play, a lot of my mnemonics would involve, I don't know, some, maybe, maybe it's more like visceral stuff of like, oh, what's, what's Richard II doing to someone, you know, and whether that becomes like violent or, or sexual even or something like that. It's like, okay, I remember that because the brain remembers that sort of thing. I, there was actually one that I did that one of the things that I figured out where I'm not very good at remembering, but like much worse than average, is let's say like you're talking about an actor. I can think of the person's face and I can name like I can name everything he's in and I just can't pull the name. And it's like, oh it's Jack Nicholson. It's like, well I can see his face. I know he was in, you know, he was the Joker, he was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he's won three Oscars. And I just can't pull that. So like I made, I was like, okay, well, let's work with this. And I made those digital flashcards where face on one side, maybe a little mnemonic and then name on the backside and just repeated that. So it's like, again, like connecting the visual to the word, that sort of thing. I, I also, for some of the slower things, I, I listen to various, you know, informational podcasts of whatever sort. And while I was doing that, I would, just I'd just kind of free form draw free associate and so like I remember Anita Bryant she's a she's a uh, singer who was then like a very staunch like anti LGBT activist in like the gosh 70s I think and she was also the face of like the Florida Orange Growers Association and I have a very strong I know that because I drew a bunch of oranges around like my little caricature of her face while I was listening to this thing and it's like that, I spent the time with it as I'm learning it and just kind of allowed myself to kind of free flow with that. And like spending the time with some of those subjects that, you know, maybe are a little less sticky for my brain. So for example, another one, I, I did a lot of jigsaw puzzles that are just like, there is one that my sister got me. So I was born in 1990. She's 15 years older than me. Like it, she's a full generation she's a gen xer and like loves the 80s and like all these 80s pop culture stuff she got me a a puzzle a jigsaw puzzle of like 80s pop culture stuff so you know i'm looking for you know sam malone from cheers or whatever for a while in this box i remember sam malone from cheers 
like that's that's something that stuck with me now because I spent that time with it. Got it. <laughs> well, those were great, and I love that you did add some personal mnemonics there too. You sketched them out when you could, and I guess for those of us that can't draw very well, stick figures work fine. Just something that represents the material you're trying to cover. Do you ever take screenshots of that and put that into your flashcards? Is that how you would use them in like digital? Of the um, of the drawings? Mm -hmm. On occasion, yeah. A lot of those, because I was studying for something that was kind of over a short time period and I had very supporting roommates that, well, let's say long suffering roommates, I put stuff all over the walls and just like, I, I made it visual for me. So for me, I very much like that physical space that I'm working in because that's like, for whatever reason, that triggers my, like, it's sort of, I mean, I guess in some ways this overlaps with like a memory palace technique, but, it, but it's my own home where it's like, oh, this wall was where all of these romantic poets were. And so like, I can kind of go over that, but I like physically made my, my living space into that, at least for as long as the roommates would allow it. Yeah, that would be a variation of a memory palace instead of doing everything sort of in your mind. You're kind of, you have a hybrid of actual, I guess, study resources that are there and then being able to recall them and where they're located. So using that kind of geospatial location, which you know, memory is really good on that. It's really good on images. So combining all of the different skills that your brain naturally has with your your own personal skills and abilities and environment is just a great way to really combine different tools together and kind of have them be synergistic. Well, I am really interested in these topics and so happy that you were able to come across so many of them too on your own and through a few supplemental resources from past Jeopardy champions. It just, it's amazing to me now, having no idea coming into this, what to expect, how many similarities there are from what you guys just seem to naturally figure out on your own and what we're also trying to struggle to do within the healthcare field. But I think the material has been really great here. Is there any last parting words for the audience? I guess I would say, like, I, I, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but figuring out what works for you is way more important than trying to fit into a pre-mold. Like, there isn't one type of person who is a doctor or you know any other medical field it's there's and it, and it's good that there are a variety of people that are coming at it from a different different angle you know that worked for me also within this game show like i'm not again i'm not as knowledgeable or as, I, i'm not nearly as as skilled as a lot of the other competitors but kind of leaning into my own strengths and just like accepting my own weaknesses as well of just like you know i'm not going to be necessarily as great at this element of it but that's okay as long as i can understand that and then work around it because the denial would be the thing that would that would harm me the most the other thing is that and this is more from my educational background that i assume a lot of people that are going into medicine maybe were gifted students when they're growing up and whatever that means within their own school district or whatever you know gifted and maybe you've discussed this before but that that can be kind of a curse as well where if you are a person who has always been praised for being smart, whatever that means, and you're praised for that when you do well on a test or something like that, then like if you fail a test, that's not just like, oops, I failed a test. It's a, oh no, my whole being is under attack right here because I'm a smart person. And if I fail this, that means I'm not a smart person. That's a hard cross to bear. There's a lot of, I know, approaches in sort of these middle grade educational settings that is really trying to move away from that sort of praise of like, oh, you're smart or for, I mean, for various reasons, but this one of them is that that is something that can be pretty detrimental and just like not allowing you to fail and learn from failure. And hopefully you don't fail on like the biggest stage because you've failed a, li a little times in the past and then being able to adapt from that prior. Having that growth mindset. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Great advice. Where can the audience find out more about you? I have a Twitter account, which is at Sam underscore Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. And I engage sometimes there. <laughs> sometimes. Hopefully That's they'll invite me back on TV at some point. We'll see. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we'll definitely add that in the show notes. And Sam, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. 
Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Chase. The Medical Mnemonist Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including USMLE tutoring and residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.